Well, we've got a lot to talk about. I'm sure we'll be getting super chats throughout the show. Filipino White Boy says, hey, Brandon, I'm beyond happy to know you're okay. Your story about leaving the left and now surviving political prison was inspirational for me. It's inspirational for me, too. I mean, you have been through so much in the past year. Yeah. And I, I remember the day when I got the text message that you had been arrested and just like my heart sunk into my stomach. And I was like, oh, no, they're going to destroy the walk away campaign. Can you tell us a little bit about what the last year has been like for you? It's almost indescribable um, because I think the reason why I say that is because before I got arrested and taken to jail, which is how it all started. Um, I was the type of person, probably like the vast majority of people, who didn't really even understand or appreciate how serious just that is. Like, I've heard numerous stories throughout my life about people saying like, oh, yeah, I went out and I had too much to drink and I ended up spending the weekend in jail and stuff. And I was, you know, I always thought it sounded kind of funny, you know, like ah, a couple days in the clink. Uh, and this has really, really been a nightmare. And and I guess I was going to say probably most people think that that's all it was, that I got arrested, I spent a few days in jail, and then I waited to for my case to resolve and have my sentencing. And it's, I, I don't think people can understand or appreciate that this is something that just went on and on and on and on. And it was like, I would get letters in the mail saying that my TSA pre-check status was revoked. And then I uh, went to the airport weeks after getting arrested and discovered that not only was my TSA pre-check status revoked, but that they had put me on an actual terrorism watch list that I have a, a designation now that's called Quad S or SSSS. And every single time that I travel, I now have to go through hours of secondary, very invasive secondary screening, uh, including that them taking pictures of my my boarding passes and my my IDs. Um, full body pat downs where they put their hands down your pants, they touch your genital. It's it's insane. And then they actually have teams of TSA agents that follow me around the airport. And you know, if I'm sitting at the the gate waiting for my flight to take off, they station agents all over to observe my behavior. And uh, and then they screen me again before I get on the airplane. I, I mean, that's just one example. I was I was um, kicked out of my apartment. Uh, right when I got out of jail, I got a notice that I had 30 days to get out of my apartment because of this case, because it was in the news. Um, and it, it just the, the absolute destruction of almost every level of my li life, every piece of my life. It, it's, you know, I have been writing about it this entire last year. And I think that pretty much most of the details are in that book. But um it's been horrible. I mean, it's just been absolutely horrible. And um, through all of it, I kind of just wondered, um, am I going to be able to come back from this? I mean, not so much in like, can I come back from this? But it, I mean, it's just emotionally, you know, it's it, it takes a lot out of you. And it makes you sort of question. You really do have to question at times, like, is this all worth it? Is what I'm fighting for worth it? Because my life has just been leveled. Yeah, I, I, I totally understand that. And I have heard parts of your book, which I think is are, are amazing what I've heard. And it seems as though you use the opportunity to be extremely self-reflective about what had kind of uh, brought you to this situation and maybe what you were going to do to move past it. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. And you're actually the first person to ask me that question. Mm -hmm. um, so I think what you're referring to is that when I got arrested and put in jail, I had this moment, it, it was like, I would almost liken it to a freight train that came to just a screeching halt. Because when I launched Walk Away in May of 2018, it, everything just exploded and started happening so fast. And there was such an overwhelmingly positive public reaction to Walk Away and interest in everything that we were doing. And everything just, I started doing speaking engagements, media appearances, I started uh, doing educational videos. We started doing a college tour. We started doing uh, minority-focused uh, town halls. Um, I was speaking at other people's events. I was doing uh, Republican functions. I was doing CPAC. I, was, I mean, it, and it was just like, just speeding along. But through all of it, I was also having this parallel 
and very bizarre experience that I never really talked about publicly and I still haven't. But in that I was kind of, it's like there was this whole faction of the conservative movement that was really supportive and really uplifting and really inclusive of me and of walk away and everything we were doing. And then there was this other group that it was completely the opposite experience in many ways. And where I, I felt that I was not being included and I felt like doors were being closed and I felt um, in many ways sabotaged in, in a lot of ways. And so I, it gave me a bit of a complex where I, I I feel like, especially going into like 2020 and probably about halfway through 2019, I started to lose sight, I think, of what really at the end of the day was most important, which is just doing the work for Walk Away, growing the movement and providing that community and that support for the people who are already in the Walk Away movement. And I started to place a lot of focus on paying attention to people and things that I felt like should probably be acknowledging and respecting the work that I'm doing. And I didn't really think were, I mean, if you look around and you look at like the Republican party and the heads of the RNC or just, you know, the party in general, or, you know, in the last administration, when, you know, when they were doing events at the white, here's an example. Um, in 2019, uh, the White House through a social media influencer summit. And they invited supposedly kind of the who's who of the conservative movement, you know, blue checks and conservative influencers. Now, in 2018, I started the walkaway campaign and I put out my walkaway video, which ended up getting like literally over 10 million views and it was shared and shared and shared. I, I used social media to start a successful social movement. I had arguably the most successful viral political video of 2018 and i'm not invited to the white house's social media influencer summit you know and it it was just always things like that where i was constantly being excluded and i was constantly like not really being acknowledged or appreciated and i started to fixate on that a lot mm -hmm. and so by the time we had gotten to january 6th I was, I had already made a plan to be in Georgia and to be a poll watcher on January 5th because I was doing this Save the Senate initiative, getting volunteers out to do door knocking and phone banking for Purdue and Leffler uh, to try to save their Senate seats. And I ended up getting invited to speak on January 6th and I didn't want to do it. I wanted to just stick with what I was doing already. And, um, but the people I was I was talking with were saying, you know, President Trump is asking people to come and this is really important for America and it's really important for the American voter and this issue is important. And one way or another, this is all going to be over on January 7th. So this is kind of like a last opportunity to be a part of something that's important and potentially historic and whatever. And unfortunately, once again, I sort of allowed myself to prioritize that feeling that I wasn't really, the work I was doing was not really being uh, acknowledged or appreciated. And I sort of thought, well, you know what? I am gonna go on January 6th and I am going to speak and I am gonna do this thing. And maybe people will see like how hard I'm, I'm trying to be of service and of value to the conservative movement. Mm -hmm. And um, so I went, everything went wrong, um, horribly, horribly wrong. And, you know, mind you, I, I didn't go inside the Capitol and I didn't engage in any acts of violence or vandalism or anything. And I didn't even witness all of the violence and vandalism that was taking place on the west side of the building, which was the opposite side of where I was, which is where people were smashing windows and scaling walls. But anyway, I, I found myself on January 25th arrested and thrown in a jail cell. And at that moment, that speeding locomotive that started on May of 2018, like, you know, it was like all of a sudden it's like it came to a screeching halt. And I was sitting in a jail cell, unable to move, unable to go anywhere, unable to do anything. And I was just like, oh, my God, like all of these people that I, I lost focus and lost sight of what I really should have been focused on. And all of these people that I was trying to get to respect me and acknowledge me and, and see what I'm doing, they're not coming. <laughs> Right. They're 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 not on their way to come help me. 
Meanwhile, there are hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people right now who are heartbroken and heart sick because they love me and they care about me. And they're now probably worried to death that I'm arrested and sitting in this jail cell. And why would I ever go looking for anything else? Like, why was I looking for anyone else's approval or affirmation than the people in this movement that I, that's the only thing that should have been important to me. You know, and I, I completely understand your perspective there. I mean, the people on my channel will tell you that I, I still complain to this day that you and Scott Pressler were not invited to speak at the RNC. Like things like that were just like some of the biggest just slaps in the face for with all the work that the two of you have done over the past couple of years. And I've just never understood it. I never understood why there would be people in the conservative movement that would want to sideline some of their most effective activists. And I certainly have opinions about why they're doing that, that I'm going to keep to myself for this particular chat. But also, I mean, I think that the revelation you came to is really important because I was asked, Brandon, I can't even tell you, every single day, multiple times a day, where's Brandon? How is Brandon doing? To the point where like, I was I was like starting to get a little persnickety about it. I was like, God damn it. Can you, guys just, can, can you just sign up for his email list? <laughs> like, this is his website. <laughs> Stop asking about this asshole. Yeah. No, no, well, it wasn't that at all. But like,